when, uh, in my early teens, I really enjoyed playing computer games. It was a real magic feeling when you, when you got, you know, you got these tapes for your tape drive to your home computer and there was a game on there. You put that in your tape drive and you started loading and you waited and waited and then suddenly some wonderful pixel graphics appeared on the screen. And it was a real magic feeling. 20 years ago, when I started my first job in the GIS industry, I started as an ArcInfo AML developer and I was responsible for getting map data into our Sun Microsystems. And we got those on tapes. So I put this in the tape drive to this old system, had made some scripts in AML, and we loaded this and loaded, and I waited and waited, and then bam, suddenly something wonderful appeared on the screen. It was, it was two map sheets, not, not, not only one. We had advanced computers, so we could see two map sheets at once. And it was the same kind of magic feeling I had when playing games. It was a deja vu moment for me. Uh, and I think this magic feeling uh, relates gaming to geospatial and geodesign. And it, at least it's what brought me here to Redlands uh, after 20 years in the industry. And uh, I'm very humbled to be here and it's very interesting to listen to all these experts and people who know a lot of stuff about geodesign. Now this first picture, this chart, might not look that very impressive, might seem a bit familiar if you look at it, but if I told you that this is how my 11-year-old son and his friends explained to me how you should plan the construction of a new city, then it might be a, a bit more impressive. And of course, he didn't draw this chart, but he explained that to me. And he and his friends had figured that out while playing the game Minecraft. Uh, I guess you've heard about Minecraft because it made a lot of news when Microsoft bought it. Quite a lot of money. And there's actually an estimated 100 million players. 100 millions. And it's, that, that's quite a few players. And to explain what it is, it's a multiplayer building by placing bricks or blocks. There's, there's not really those clear goals in these games. It's much about constructing and sur surviving. And it's been immensely popular. And I, I don't know if you saw the news yesterday that Microsoft uh, have created a set of new glasses, the HoloLens. And what was in their demonstration on the YouTube, of course, there was a hologram with someone in the living room building blocks with Minecraft with these lenses. That was yesterday. Now, so this is how my son and his friend did this, figured this out. I heard this conversation from his room two years ago, and, and I don't know if you know how kids play games nowadays. It's like they have dozens of screens, they have their cell phone, they're on Skype, they're chatting, they're typing. It's, it's, it's very collaborative. There's a lot of stuff going in. It's like uh, mission control in Houston. <laughs> and what I heard was stuff like, yeah, let's build a city. They're, they're about 11 at this station. Let's build a city. Yeah, we need a school like that area. We need a fire station. We need roads and stuff like that. But then, then they realized that this will take a while. So someone said, there, we got to organize ourselves. So we, we, what they did was that they started to build this house. It didn't say city planning office. It, I translated that from Swedish. <laughs> no, but they built a house, and they started setting plans up here with signs that we should build a school, we should build a fire station, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then they had meeting in this room, in this virtual wall, planning what they should build in this uh, town. And yesterday, when I listened to Mr. Steinitz about collaborative work and the tools there, uh, there was some kind of deja vu moment again. And I also realized that my 11-year-old son probably knows more about geodesign than I do <laughs> at this stage. So uh, th that's what I did. And, and, and this was a good moment for me because I could finally explain what dad is doing at work. <laughs> that's, otherwise, it's just like I work with maps. And it, it's been known for a while that Minecraft 
can be used in uh, public space planning and so on. So there's been a project with UN Habitat and Mojang, which is the company that makes Minecraft. But as far as I know, there's until quite recently not been a way, a standardized, automated way to exchange geospatial information with, with this game environment. So that got me and a colleague called Peter Sigerstedt looking into this as we are, well, we were very interested in technology and moving data from different formats and places. So we started developing a prototype of doing that. And, and we did that in uh, the data interoperability extension or FME as it's known. They, they have a booth outside or an exhibit if you're interested in that. We made a prototype for that. And this was the first experiment we did. In. And as you see here, this is an IFC file or a BIM file that this prototype then converted into Minecraft like this. And you, there is some OpenStreetMap data that we put on a plain floor. So we could use that as a canvas for build stuff in Minecraft. Excuse me. Now, I had a magic moment again. I was actually in a nuclear power plant when this happened, working with, um, it's true, uh, we're working on a project with uh, dismantling a power plant and we were responsible for generating 3D graphics there. And I got a call from the Swedish Center for Architecture and Design. This was in the summer of 2013 and they heard that we had some piece of prototype that could convert data into Minecraft and they asked me, in, in the nuclear power plant on our phone. Could you load the entire Stockholm into Minecraft? And uh, of course I said yes. Still it was a prototype. And I thought, I have the best job in the world. I'm in a, working with a, a nuclear power plant, 3D graphics, and someone is calling me to get data into a game. And this was the Swedish Center for Architecture and Design. And they have figured out this project called Blockholm. And the idea there was that one morning the Stockholmers woke up and there's been a great hurricane and removed all the buildings and they will get a new chance to remodel the city from scratch. So everything there except the buildings should be there in this model. It should be an exact replica of Stockholm. So that's what we started to do. And it turned out to be quite tricky because if, as it's blocks in Minecraft. It's, it's like a LiDAR scan, you can say, but it's even more dense because you have the, the ground. The ground is filled with blocks and water is full with blocks and stuff like that. So it's quite a lot of data we had to work with there. But we figured that out, how to do that, but we also needed something to keep order in this world because we expected thousands of players and we got tens of thousands of players in this project. And the idea there was we should keep the the real properties there. We keep them in there. And when someone log into the game for the first time, they get assigned a property, and they're only allowed to build within that. But it's the real properties that exist in Stockholm. So we made a solution for that, and I'm gonna show you how that looks on a movie. This is our head office in Stockholm, by the way. So you can see how this looks when you log into this. So now I am the Swaker user, and now I am in this game. And this is our lot, which you might have guessed. And if I go down to the ground here, and in the game, I try to place a brick or a block. I'm not allowed to do that if I'm not inside my property. <laughs> so it's actually, the game is actually querying a geographic database. Do I have a building permit here <laughs> or not? That's, uh, that's actually the truth. And it's the true properties we're having there. So now I'm into the white stuff here and I can start building a brick wall. Let's see if it sticks. Yeah, it does. So doing some improvement at our office in here. Now, the grand finale of this project was an exhibit in 2014, in, in March. And it was really a success in the way that there were tens and thousands of players joining into this game. And the center had an exhibit, and what they did was that the jury selected the most innovative constructions in, their, in this Minecraft world, and they made scale models 
uh, blocks like this and built us as an exhibit. So you can walk around there and see the creations, leave comments, and so on. And uh, that's me. And it was a really interesting experience walking around this exhibit. And I thought, well, okay, what's been done here? What, what happened? Well, it engaged a lot of people, uh, made this exhibit. I know the architects involved in this project, they got some interesting feedback, especially uh, how people can build tall buildings. There's not really a tradition in Sweden to build tall buildings because there's a lot of space in there. But then I figured out what's been done. Well, this is crowdsourcing of what could be. I think that's what happened in this case. And, and it's interesting, I think, as stated in the beginning here, that if we relate this to, say, OpenStreetMap, the kind of reference crowdsourcing project, I think they have about 1.5 or 2 million users who really contribute, who upload edits. And here we have uh, the potential of using 100 million, 100 million users in here. So that's, there, there is something in this that can be really useful, I think. Now, I've been involved in quite a few of similar projects, and this is from the most recent ones. It's a city in Sweden called Kristianstad, or Kristianstad, as we say. And they want to uh, develop a specific area in here, a smaller area, but the, the idea here is that they want to involve the younger people in the community to have their... What, what do they want to say about this development in this, this area? So here... And, and I can say this is an interesting experience for me, because I've been working in this industry for 20 years, and at our company we have architects, we have landscape architects, geologists, IT people, and it's hard to get all these people in one room at the same time. And it's the same in these projects. But when starting these projects, and we say that we're going to do a gaming project, they all appear in the same room. <laughs> it's the same at the municipalities. The different departments get together. I'm not really sure why. It's kind of a neutral ground or something like this. And it's a very interesting experience for me. But in this case, we, we really used some other kind of data. We had LiDAR in here, and we wanted to keep the buildings and the vegetation. So we set up a process where we created a model that looks something like this. And you know, it's, it's a block building game. So hopefully you recognize these structures. And, and these are generated from the LiDAR data. They are a little more dull buildings. But you can also see that the vegetation, it's really placed where it's coming from. So we use that from the classification of the LiDAR to put that into the Minecraft world. And the more colorful stuff in here, that's what the kids created. And I keep saying kids, which is a bit dangerous, because uh, it, it's kind of natural to think it's kids playing computer games, but I think the ages are getting older there. You're getting older. I play games. So it's not only kids who have constructed this. And I think it looks pretty impressive when you think that it's only one meter blocks you work with in here. And it's an interesting scale to work with one meter block. And here's another example of how it can look. And once again, I'm not an architect. There are probably a few here. And, but I think this is, this is pretty good for be, being a 10-year-old kid planning a building. So it's, it looks pretty good. At least it looks very much like the architecture, modern architecture in the southern parts of Sweden, I would say. And also, as I say, the resolution here is that you place one meter bricks or one meter blocks in here. And I think it's a kind of optimal scale to build stuff that's of a resolution that is enough. It's fast to build with, and, but it's not too detailed, so you get stuck in details figuring out how to construct stuff. Now, here's another example. Well, and this is from the workshops. We often have workshops initiating this project where you invite kids. And, it, and it's a really a heartwarming feeling when you can see a 13-year-old boy or girl telling a 40-year-old man from the city planning office how he should construct something. <laughs> That's, 
and it's really, really amazing to see and see how people behave in these environments. And in this workshop, there were kids from 10 up to 18, and the people from the municipality who were a bit older in that case. But so far, these projects, there's been a lack, because as I mentioned, this standardized way of getting data in and out of this system, because that's really necessary to do something really, really useful of this. We've got to be able to take care of this information. And so what's happened now is there is in the data interoperability extension, or FME, a way to both, both write Minecraft, and you do that like creating other maps. You set a style, do what kind of brick or block do you want, and you can create this world based on your 3D data coming in there. But the most interesting part is that you can read that data too. So at this case, I, and, and in this gaming world, there are states, there are, uh, if you save a date in there, you can see how the world looked at the specific date. So this is the 17th of August, and we read it into FME, or the Data Interoperability Extension. And this is how it looks, and it's handled like a point cloud. And it's really the best point cloud ever existed. If you're into a point cloud, read Minecraft data, because there is no of these annoying decimals there. People are, that it's aligned, the data is aligned, it's one meter resolution, it's perfect <laughs> if you want to try algorithm there due to the resolution. And, and here you can see that the classification will be a code here, and that's a code for what kind of brick it is. And we can read this as point cloud data, or a laser scan. And the interesting thing with, with that is that we can do the same operations on this as we can do with other types of laser scans. So this is a point cloud analysis where I compare two dates of this world. So this is August 17 and November 11. So I compare this. And what can I do then? Well, I can see this is stuff that has been removed or has disappeared. And we see that there are some buildings that has disappeared, but also some leaves. Does this mean that the kids don't want trees? Well, it, it means that the trees are really growing in these physics engines. So that means that these leaves exist, but they're on a higher level in there. So we can see it in the next picture here. So this is what has been created in this world this analysis. So we can see these uh, structures that have been and all the growth that's been going on. And we can take care of this by some nifty algorithms in the geospatial tools and the data interoperability extension, uh, like this. And this is what we got. And this is how I did a, a version where we wrote this to KML. Of course, we can do this with much nicer coloring using texture and so on. But that means that we could put data into the Minecraft world and we can get it back. And I took this uh, city engine training class previously here, and that will work perfectly doing that in there too. So that's something we will look into. And finally, an observation. That, that's something I learned, how, I should pay, say, people behave in this virtual world. They pretty much behave as in the real world, <laughs> I would say. And th this is a true story. Someone had built a pile on, on, their, on their property in, in Blockholm, and someone set up this sign there, please remove that pile in there. And, but this is something useful, as people tend to behave the same way in as in the same world. And the gaming industry, they know that. So, for instance, some of these companies, when they develop new games, uh, these new blockbuster games where, you can know, it's often involved quite a lot of violence in them, but doesn't have to do. Uh, but they create these models. It can be a city or an environment, and what they do is, when they created the first version, they put this up for alpha or beta testing, and they invite a lot of players. And they play this online. And these gaming companies, they monitor how these masses of people move around in this world, because it's important for their gaming story to get uh, uh, to fit. So they want people to move that street, or move in that street, or half in this way. They, they tweak the environment, so they can see how these thousands of players in this alpha environment move this. And I think that that is really something that could be used in the geodesign concept, too. 
the same process, simulate the world, make it gamish, and see how people move around this world, tweak it, and see the effects like that. Uh, we do have people who work with uh, uh, fire research at our company who use these advanced AI algorithms to see how people will evacuate a building or an area if there is a fire. Why not make a game of that instead, for, for instance? So, I'm approaching the end there, I think. Am I good with time? I, I should quit with just the final story about getting here. This, this Monday, I went here about plane, and um, while entering the US border, as I come from Sweden, and you know there's an officer who asks you, what are you going to do here? What's your business? And I said, I'm visiting a conference. And he asked me, what kind of conference? It's a geodesign conference. And then he looked at me very suspiciously, <laughs> heart eyes, and he asked, now, can you explain to me what geodesign is? <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I'm going to learn, I said. So, but uh, <laughs> hopefully next time, I might be traveling with Mr. Steinitz or something that can explain that. But uh, the next time, I hope that uh, I will be able to give him a much better answer after being at this great event. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.